Why is it that my arms look smaller than they are, but my gut looks bigger than it is? Rhetorical question. Shining a light on autism and life as an autistic person. Welcome to My Friend Autism, a podcast breaking down barriers, stigma and misconceptions around autism while increasing understanding and acceptance of the autistic community. And now, here's your neurodivergent host, Orion Kelly. I didn't turn my mic on. <laughs> I did the, the, the radio sin, my friend. I've done that many times in my radio career. I talked, but I hadn't got my mic on. <laughs> oh, God. You know what? That's the first time that's ever happened on my podcasts yet. For someone who had a long and distinguished radio career, I can't tell you how many times I went to talk on the radio and realised I hadn't turned my mic on. (sighs) And now I've done it on a podcast. Well, isn't that special? Aren't you all special? (laughs) You've witnessed history, my friends. You've witnessed history. Start this again uh, without starting it again. Welcome to My Friend Autism, my podcast, which you can listen to wherever you get your podcasts or you can watch on my dedicated video podcast YouTube channel, Orion Kelly Podcasts. Either way, thank you for being here. I'm Orion Kelly, that autistic guy. I'm all about providing validation and support for autistic people and their loved ones. And this podcast, I'm going to break into two parts. I want to deep dive into demand avoidance. I want to talk about how it can impact autistic kids, which will clearly be helpful for parents, carers, teachers, support workers, friends, family of autistic kids. And then on the next podcast, I want to deep dive into how it can impact autistic adults. So demand avoidance is the topic for the next two podcasts, which I promise the next time I do one, I will have my mic turned on before I start talking. It's something I I virtually guarantee. My Friend Autism with Orion Kelly. Catch up on all the episodes at orionkelly.com.au. Then again, I can't guarantee that. I can't guarantee that. You're wondering, what do you mean you turn your mic on? Well, there's a mute button, yeah? So what I do is I, I, I mute it. When the, uh, when the opener is going, so the opener to my, you know, show. Does that make any sense either? I said, well, we're using all this radio lingo. Forget about it. You know what? Just forget about it. Just shut up, okay? Just give me a spell, all right? Just, hey, 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 I'm the one doing the work here. You're just listening or watching, so chill out, champ. <laughs> this is a bad start. All right, let's go, my friends. I want to talk about managing demand avoidance in autistic kids. This is a massive challenge, a massive challenge that many parents, carers, friends, family of autistic kids grapple with. Now, we're talking about demand avoidance. I don't know. That didn't sound right. I was trying to say the words demand avoidance. I want to start. So I've got some practical tips and I've got some triggers, but I want to start just going back over this because some people might be new to this. Okay, so let's, let's just talk about the distinction between demand avoidance and the clinical diagnose pathological demand avoidance. Some people will refer to it as persistent demand avoidance. I think they're trying to make it sound nicer, are they? Okay, this is the thing. So the the medical world labeled conditions and then other people try to rename them to make them nicer. I I get the sentiment, but if you're the actual person with the condition, there's nothing nice about it. So making the name nicer doesn't actually help us, but maybe it makes you feel better, so that's cool. Okay, so... I mean, and by the way, is persistent even pathological? Like if we looked at the definition of pathological, sorry, I'm touching my eyes here if you're watching the video podcast. Um, I had a haircut earlier today and I think there's hair in my eyes and it's just, it's not going to go well. I can see that happening. Anyway, this is, if you like the haircut, let me know. If you don't, get stuffed. The bottom line is pathological demand avoidance, right, is a clinically diagnosed condition. Now, what I'm referring to in this podcast is demand avoidance. So we're talking about the subclinical manifestation of demand avoidance. In saying that, a lot of the triggers, a lot of the things that happen with autistic kids probably fit the the mold of a clinical diagnosis, but either way, this can still help you. What is it? 
Okay, so demand avoidance is a reluctance or resistance to comply with demands, instructions, or, and this is really, really key, or expectations. Expectations. A resistance or reluctance to comply with demands, instructions, or expectations. And here's the thing. These things that are perceived as challenging or overwhelming. Overwhelming is key. Don't forget that. Oh, my kid, he's a brat. All right, I tell her to do something and she just says no. What a brat. Okay, no, no. Maybe the thing is overwhelming to her. Maybe the thing is challenging to him. Who knows? This reluctance, it manifests in so many different ways. Okay, they might procrastinate about doing something. They might show sheer defiance, even outright refute. I don't know why I bothered today. Even outright refusal to engage in certain activities. I bothered for you, by the way. Did I, did I feel like this was the best day to do this? I don't know, probably not. Why did I do it? For you. So please, just give me some. See, I can't even give you a, f- oh, that's how bad I am. Just give me some, oh, what am I going to give you? Just give me some. Oh. <laughs> so this is really, really significant. When you think about this, so you have a person in your life, a young autistic person in your life, and they are unable to do certain things. You've instructed them to do, asked them to do, expect them to do, because it's so challenging, it's overwhelming. Now, they put it off. They outright defy you. They refuse to do it. That doesn't look good. But we have to recognise that demand avoidance is not a deliberate choice. It's a coping mechanism. So autistic kids are using demand avoidance as a way of coping and managing stress, anxiety, even sensory overload. Can you see how annoying this is to be a parent or a carer? But can you see how important this is as a tool, a coping tool for autistic kids, people in general? So just quickly in contrast, we're talking about the the clinical version, so pathological demand avoidance. So it's characterized by extreme need for control and a pervasive avoidance of everyday demands. Does that equal persistent? Potentially, I guess, maybe more constant? I don't know. It's persistent and constant. Uh, we're going to move on. Unlike typical demand avoidance that, like we see in autistic kids, people who have the clinical diagnosis of PDA display a profound and consistent resistance to all forms of demands regardless of the context or severity. So this resistance often extends beyond external demands. It can include internal pressures, expectations. So it's pretty essential to recognise that demand avoidance is a common trait amongst autistic kids and people, but not all the demand avoidant type behaviour you see in autistic people actually signifies a clinical diagnosis of PDA, pathological demand avoidance. So what I'm saying is this subclinical level is real and significant, and we're going to focus on that. So let's go through some triggers. These are common triggers for demand avoidance for autistic kids, and really for everyone. But I will do a fully-fledged adult version in the next podcast. Okay, so sudden changes in routine or environment, big trigger. This seems like a given. But remember, if things are going to start to be a challenge to you, an extra thing to do, they're overwhelming, they're stressful, they're anxiety-ridden, and you're already dysregulated because of changes in routine or environment, you are not going to be able to rise to the challenge. Sensory overload, same deal. Anything that overwhelms you as an autistic person, people like to go down the route of, That means bright lights and loud noises. Great, fantastic. It does. You're right. It also means smells. It also means different environments, new environments, weird environments. You know what sensory overloads me? People that just don't stop talking. Now, autistic people do that. Let me finish. Don't stop talking to you in a way where they're like trying to 
talk to you like you know them or your 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 friends or you want to talk to you know like when you meet people or whatever and it's like can you leave me alone that's what i want to say anyway that's a sensory overload too because this you can't take all the input because when people talk to you or you interact that's input that's a sensory input right your eyes your ears you know i guess your nose but it's going through so that that feeds into another trigger social demands bloody social demands are tricky with kids, it can be going to school, right? Activities, groups, classes. For all autistic people, it can be anything to do with social demands. So you must look me in the eye when you talk. You must, you must show body language that you're interested when we're trying to process a conversation because we are interested, but in doing that, we're moving our body or using our eyes in a way that makes you think we're disinterested. See, these kind of demands you place upon us might make you feel good in one instance, but they will get defiance in another. So these are the things that trigger demand avoidance. I've instructed you to do something. I've told you to do something. You know, I expect you when I get home to have done this. Why didn't you do it? Right? It just comes across like, what's wrong with you? Do you, not, do you not want to do things? Do you not want to be in this family? Are you trying to defy me? Do you not hear me? Blah, blah, blah. All rubbish. Nothing to do with that. Feeling overwhelmed by too many tasks or instructions is a massive trigger for demand avoidance. Absolutely something I can relate to. Okay, you asked me to do seven things today. So that seemed like too much, so I did none of them. Why? Because there was too many things. Or I asked you to do one thing. Why couldn't you do it? Because when I looked at the instructions, I was too overwhelmed. I shut down, right? You can't, you can't do that to autistic people. It's not because we're not capable it's because of the challenge that we have in not only processing things, our processing time can be much slower, right? It takes time. But, in the, but leading up to the processing time, we catastrophize. Things become overwhelming. And our brain, in effect, says, no, this is not, not, no, too much stress, too much anxiety, no, not happening. That's a big one. Another trigger. Failure or criticism, the fear is all it takes. Just the fear of failure and criticism is all it takes. Well, no, I'm not going to do that thing because I'll do it badly. Right? I'll, well, you'll, you'll, say I did, you'll say I do it badly or, I won't, or I'll, I'll fail. I won't be able to do it. See, suddenly it's not about you just wanting to defy someone. It actually has nothing to do with them. Physical discomfort can trigger. So... Okay, think about it like this. Why does your kid not want to put on their school uniform or put on certain clothing in the morning? Because they just don't like you, right? They want, to, they want to make you late for work. They just decided they woke up this morning and said, I'm just going to make your life hell. No. Physical discomfort. What's the texture? How many tags are there? Does it feel nice? You put it on, mate. See what you think. You wear this bloody school jumper and tell me how you think it feels. It feels bloody horrible. Have you tried? Have you, have you felt? Like seriously. And by the way, these, it's, something's happened in the tag business. I don't know what happened in the tag business, but you know, back in my day in the early 1930s when I was a child, it's, that's a joke, what I'm, it was the 40s. What I'm saying is you maybe had one tag at best, right? These days, every, every garment of clothing, every item of clothing has about, I'm, I'm going to give a, a, you know, like a, estimation from my experience somewhere between five and 75 tags now there's no need for that many tags one sure when we start having like five to ten tags you can't even cut them off because they're too fat you've actually i actually have to cut tags off clothing in stages if you have to cut your tags off your clothing in stages because it's too fat for scissors you need a guillotine You've passed the point of too many tags, mate. What are you telling us? Oh, God. Oh, it's better move on. <clears throat> More triggers for demand avoidance. Emotional stresses. For kids, this is big. So transitions. Kids hate transitions, one thing to another. Kids hate the conflict of issues with siblings, friends, family. These types of things are emotionally stressing. They will impact their ability to want to do tasks. Clear expectations or structure, another big one. 
Think about it. We've talked about it with the instructions. Okay, so what's the structure on this demand or this or this task you're asking the child to complete? What, how is it structured? It's not. I just said the result. What's the result? The result is clean your room or get dressed. Right? Okay, hang on. That's not really clear and there's no real structure. Okay? So clear expectations and structure will always help and it's way less overwhelming. Can you please just make your bed? Can you please just focus on putting your socks and shoes on as opposed to I want you dressed, brushed your teeth, what you know, combed your hair, gone to the toilet in the next five minutes. No, just focus on the one thing, yeah? Activities perceived as boring or uninteresting. This is a big trigger for demand avoidance. Now, this is where it gets complicated, okay? I feel like Rango telling a story. Listen up because this is where it gets complicated. Uh, one bullet? Um, Rango reference there. I apologize. It's just um, that there's a belly button. Another Rango reference. I apologize. I don't know what. That's what I said. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I won't. I've got, I've got no more. Not as much as the daddy's cooking. Sorry. I apologize. Rango references stops now. Damn, I love that movie. Okay, here we go. So what was I saying? I forgot. <laughs> Boring or uninteresting. Okay, autistic kids are definitely going to push back on things they simply don't want to do or have no relevance to them or are boring, okay? It's not my job, by the way, to fix this for you. If I, I don't want to do things I'm not interested in. I know you've got to do some things, okay? So, yeah, sometimes you're going to need to, you're going to, need to help them navigate that, right? It's, so saying no, so don't, saying no to brushing your teeth, and you're saying, yes, and they're saying, no, yes, no, yeah, not going to work, right? Okay, great. Like, little buddy, no one really likes brushing your teeth, right? The only reason why we have to brush our teeth twice a day is to keep our teeth healthy so they don't fall out and we have no teeth to enjoy yummy foods. Yeah, do you see what I'm saying? It doesn't make any sense. If you just say, you know, do this, do that, if they think it's completely unnecessary or they're bored or uninterested. Here's more for you. Unfamiliar social situations or social gatherings with unfamiliar people. Wow, how bad is that for autistic adults, let alone kids? Why would you want to take autistic kids to unfamiliar places for starters that are social, right? Unfamiliar places where people are gathering socially. And the majority of those people, they don't know. And then you think it's going to be hard for them to listen and comply to your instructions during that time? You, then that, that, makes, that makes you the issue in this situation, not them. Pressure to perform, even participate in activities that is not part of what they usually like to do, is breaking through their level of comfort, okay? You can say comfort zone is something you should break as a person for growth. Yeah, that's right. But as an autistic kid, this is their life. They live in a neurotypical world. They go to a school with neurotypical kids. They have expectations based on that you must be like every other kid. You must live, breathe, learn, eat, drink, play like everyone else. You think they don't already live out of their comfort zone? What's wrong with you? So forcing them or pressuring them to do things, activities, you know, performing that kind of stuff like in gatherings or whatever, because you think it's getting them out of their comfort zone. Yeah, it's going to trigger demand avoidance because they live out of their comfort zone, guys. Autistic kids, you, you can say, oh, they have a great life or whatever, you know, they get to do this, do that, other kids can't. Their entire life is out of their comfort zone. So we've got, we've got to just push that aside, this whole idea of, oh, it's good to get out of here. Yeah, it's good. How's it going for them? All right, some more triggers, and then I've got some practical tips. So demands for verbal communication or expressive language when as an autistic person they may well struggle to express themselves or they may not really want to verbalise stuff. They might not. Now, by the way, you do not need to be a non-speaking autistic person to prefer non-verbal communication. No. No. Not true. Like I'm an autistic person. I'm, I, I, I clearly communicate verbally. Okay, great. But it doesn't mean I'm like, oh, yeah, give me a call, we'll chat. No, I don't want that. Text me. 
email me, right? Or if I might want to convey feelings to a loved one, I might do it better by writing it down on a note or emailing them or texting them rather than telling it to their face, right? This is a struggle. These are preferences not based on like we just want to make the world hard, on based on how our brain interacts and understands and expresses ourselves and also the feelings of others, which is part of alexithymia. So that's a big one. Don't demand, you know, the same things you would expect a neurotypical person to do and you're demanding it upon them because, I don't know what, there's other people in your family that are neurotypical and you just forgot or just don't do it. Changes in temperature or weather conditions can actually affect sensory sensitivities. They can affect regulation. Okay, so for starters, obviously, you know, you don't have to be autistic to know that certain weather conditions dysregulate you. It's too cold or it's too hot. I can't take this heat anymore, right? Or loud noises like loud wind or rain or hail or whatever it is. These things dysregulate. These things, are, you know, are, can be really sensitive for autistic people. They are clearly going to trigger demand avoidance. Again, because where's the regulation? Where's the capacity to meet those demands? Now, these are overstimulating environments. You can add to the add to the list of overstimulating environments. You know, not just weather, but people. Uh, you know, uh, ambience, um, uh, lights, action. So shops, cities, people. It, it, there's so many different ways that you can be overstimulated in these environments. Academic demands for autistic kids requiring sustained attention or focus for extended periods. So the school day can be absolutely unrealistic for starters, but. Doing that, like that's just a given every day. You just have to. You get to school before, and by the time you leave, uh, you can have a break, right? But get to school from then to the leave time. I need you to just focus and learn and be like everyone else. It's not going to happen, guys. And and the more you demand this kind of sustained attention and focus, the less you're going to get of it, and the more you're going to experience demand avoidance on every little thing. It's a response. It's not a brat. Interruptions to activities and interests, special interests for autistic kids, autistic adults. No one likes being interrupted when they're spending time on their, on their passions because these are things we use to regulate ourselves. Like Superman would go and get, you know, get some energy from the sun. Autistic people use our special interests. It's like an alone time of passions to recharge. Pressure to conform to expectations of the wider community. These are big big weapons against the mental health of autistic people. Now, this can be anything from your behaviour, how you act, to how you look and appear. Because autistic kids might want to dress differently, might have different styles, and, and they might not be what one would class as fashionable. Okay, fair enough. But making them conform to these expectations, these norms we've built to how you should act and look and talk, this is not going to help. If, if it's important to you, by the way, that your autistic kids are able to actually carry out instructions and expectations, right? Because I think it, it is important and they, it's important they do these things. So we need to do things to help them achieve that. Just a couple more triggers, then I've got practical tips. Autonomy is big. So lack of autonomy or control over their own decisions, their own activities, their own life is a big trigger for autistic kids, for autistic adults. Now, why is that? People go, you know, like, what am I, raising a psychopath? They have to control everything. You know, I, I dig that. I get that. I understand that. But let me just set this straight. Autistic people do not want to control everything because we are in some way, you know, psychopathic or something. The only reason why we seek to control things, and I know it sounds like we're like the directors of everyone's life, is because of pure anxiety and also Pure fear of dysregulation, of fear, failure, being kicked out, right? This is, and how does that make any sense? Wouldn't you be less kicked out if you did what people told you to do and let them control it? Probably, but our mind doesn't look at it like that. We're looking at it like if we can control things, we are absolutely able to minimise periods of dysregulation and then that makes us better people and then people will hopefully like us more so autonomy and control is massive autistic kids are gonna you know you're gonna think their their kind of demand avoidance moments 
are acts of defiance and they are, but they're not based on the premise of what you think they're trying to do. Like, you know, stuff you, I don't care what you say. Really that autonomy and control is more based on the way their, our brain works. This is authority or not authority, unless there's a common sense reason for what you're telling me to do, why would I do it? You know, uh, what's the motivation here? And, and also I know what I've got to do to control myself, keep myself regulated and happy and peaceful. And this is how I do it. So don't try to take that away from me. All right, being placed in competitive or high-pressure situations can trigger autistic kids to feel like they're being judged and they're being compared to their peers, most of who are probably not neurodivergent. But this happens. Competitive, high-pressure situations, you might think, oh, what is that, like going going for an audition in an Oscar-winning movie or something? No, no. So, no, for an autistic kid... Competitive and high pressure could be just sports at school or being forced into a school production or into some sort of music recital or going to an assembly. Now, these are competitive, high pressure situations for autistic kids because, number one, there's a big group of people. Number two, they have to, to interact or perform to some degree and people are going to look at them and judge them. And also, they're going to compare themselves, why can't I be, why can't I be as good at this sport as that kid? Or why can't you know I play the instrument like them? You see what I'm saying? These things, uh, they are super triggering. So let's get to some practical examples. But first, uh, just a quick uh, drink of coffee. You, you can have a drink too if you want, just not from my drink. Hang on one second. Oh, just one more, sorry. Oh, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> I appreciate that. It means a lot. Okay, here we go. Practical tips for navigating demand avoidance in autistic kids. Obviously, these aren't hard and fast because every autistic kid's different. All right, let's establish a predictable routine. Let's stick to this predictable routine as much as possible. What does that mean? Eating food, as in meals, shouldn't be a pop-up thought restaurant kind of thing, right? You should have specific times. They might be windows, but you should have specific times. You can hang your hat on when you, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Bedtime, same deal. You can't, I mean, so yes, autistic kids are going to fluctuate, but it doesn't mean that this is not when it starts though. So you, look, your bedtime's 8 o'clock, mate. You might not be sleepy, but it's time to go to bed. So there's no more TV or devices or this or that. You know, it's, it's bedtime. If that means you need to wind down in your bedroom and not go to sleep, that's fine, but it's bedtime. You know it is. Even activities can be structured. So what you're looking for is a consistency throughout their day-to-day life. This really helps. Number two, and I don't know why I'm numbering them. I apologize. <laughs> Provide clear and concise instructions. My whole life is an apology to people. So we're talking about breaking tasks down into smaller steps. Clear, concise instructions, small, easy to understand steps. A good example, I've talked about this before with cleaning your room. So instead of saying, you know, clean your room, you want to break it down in smaller steps. I already gave an example of saying, can you just make your bed? All right, so you might say, I need you to please pick up the toys in your room and put them away. That's very specific. It's clear and concise. So I'm not asking you to pick up the toy and then drop it. Pick up the toy and place it where it belongs, okay? Or can you please go to your room, get all your dirty clothes and bring them down to the laundry? This is clear and concise. Another strategy. You want to offer choices whenever possible. Okay, this empowers your child, but it also reduces the feelings of being overwhelmed, which then reduces the the ability to trigger demand avoidance. Okay, so for example, would you like to do your homework now or after dinner? So we are talking about a clear choice. You're doing your homework. I'm making it clear you're doing your homework. I'm not just going to say when you get home through the door, do your homework. Have you done your homework yet? Do it. Right? It's like, okay, I know it's time to relax for you and unwind, but you do have homework. So let's work out when we're going to do it. Would you like to do your homework now and get it out of the way? Or would you like to do your homework once you've finished your dinner? Another one, visual supports. So, you know, these things can be more helpful than you think. 
They don't need to be over-the-top extravagant, schedules, charts, timers, things that help them understand and also transition, right, because they know they're going from one to the other. So you're creating visual schedules for the day. They could be pictures, they could be symbols, they could be magnets, drawings, cartoons, things that helps your autistic child know what to expect. That way there's less chance of the demand avoidance kicking in. Creating a calm, sensory-friendly environment at home is obviously a big one. Now, why? Well, you're minimising triggers. If your child is arriving home after a big day, whether it's at school or with friends or whatever, they're going to be dysregulated probably. So your, your goal is to provide them with an opportunity to regulate themselves because this is, what, this is how autistic kids are going to have a good quality of life. So, you know, this could be a quiet space. This could just be making sure that your house is clearly just a good, safe space for them. Okay, you know, sometimes it can come, people might go, I hate the lighting in my house, right? So that's fine. Others could be, I just need to get more kind of sensory friendly seats, chairs, tables, you know, uh, equipment, beds, toys, and whatever it is that will help your child feel like they can come home and unravel and regulate themselves and kind of bring themselves back is what you're looking for. And that just means walking around your own house and, and it's not about throwing everything out, but walking around, your, walking around your own house and going, you know, what things here just don't need to be this, this triggering? Like what, what's going on? You know, and only you can answer that question. <clears throat> I mean, I could answer it, but it's $10,000. No, it's not, it's not, that's not true. I, I don't have an answer. Uh, please don't ask for an answer. All right, here's another, t- here's another tip for you. How about this one? Practice patience and understanding. What? Sorry, what? Patience and understanding? I've been more patient and understanding for my autistic child than any one other parent on the planet has, so get stuffed or I know. Fair enough. Maybe you can do it a bit more. So practice patience and understanding, acknowledging your child's feelings, and do this all without judgment. Well, then you've drawn the line out, Ryan. See, when you said without judgment, you've drawn the line, mate. One thing to say, be nice to them and understanding and acknowledge their feelings, but do not judge them. What's wrong with you, Ryan? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. This is, de- this is just a gentle reminder. Okay, I know you're patient and understanding and you don't judge them, but could you do that all a little bit more? Maybe. If your child becomes um- upset, maybe you should just validate their feelings rather than getting upset too. And maybe you might say things like, stop being such a whinger or, you know, or you can't act like that or what is going on, stop that, or do this, what's happening, blah, 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 right? You might just go, you know, I, I understand that that loud noise probably really bothered you, probably really scared you, probably really set you off, probably really made you angry. Is there, is there anything you'd like to tell me about what happened or would you like to just find a quiet place to relax for a while? So you're validating that clearly this thing has triggered them, right? And it's made them feel things. And you're providing them with options. They might not know. Honestly, this is is going to sound ridiculous to you, but I, I promise you. So I get startled by noise a lot. And my initial response is pure anger. I am so angry that, that someone created that noise. And they think I'm angry at them and they think I give them a death stare. And I probably do, but I'm not angry at them and I don't want to kill them. I'm angry at the scenario, the noise, because it, it, it's so disproportionate, my reaction, the level of startled and anger that comes from the noises that I don't expect. As an autistic person, it's so disproportionate. It's just impossible for people to understand. But for me, like forget about making me stressed and, and, and you know, my anxiety, my stress goes up, right? There's this big response cortisol pulsing through, all that kind of stuff. Forget about that. I get so angry. I'm so angry at the noise. How dare that noise happen and startle me? All right, another tip, use positive reinforcement. So we're talking about praising and encouraging your autistic child when they're able to behave in a way that makes them happy and, and they're regulated but also is, is a good, a good behaviour to reward. So we're talking about celebrating small achievements and efforts. We're not talking about changing them. We're talking about when they're able to be regulated 
and behave in a certain way that makes them feel proud about how they're acting and also is a good way to act. Acknowledge it. Celebrate it. These can be anything. They might try something new and really bloody love it, right? Instead of going, I told you you would. You kept saying no and I told you you would, right? <laughs> no, one, no one wants to hear that ever. You go, I'm so glad. I'm so glad you were brave and tried this because it looks like you really enjoyed it. So I'm so glad that you, you were so brave and you tried this today because it looks like, looks like it was so much fun, was it? Offer alternatives to challenging tasks or activities whenever possible. Okay, not always possible. Okay. Look, here's an example from our own autistic kid. All right. Let's say they struggle with handwriting. They can't just use text type thing or they can't just use speech to text. Oh, no, 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 no. They've got to, got to be able to write. Okay, cool. That's fine. I agree. That's a good skill to have. But if my child has the story in his mind and he can bring it to life by reading it into his iPad and the iPad, you know, tech, doing the speech to text, and then you have a great story that you can assess based on my child's creativity, why is that not okay because he didn't use his hand to provide you the story? Can he not provide you the story with his mind and his voice? Right? This, again, these are, they're such hard and fast rules. I acknowledge that the importance of being able to write, but I also acknowledge that a lot of autistic kids may achieve things significantly later than, than their peers, and that's not because anything's wrong with them. That's because they're autistic, and sometimes that happens. But the fact that it happened proves there's no rush. I just think alter, alternatives to challenging tasks are so powerful. If there's something that your autistic kid really struggles with, and you know there's such an easy, quick fix to help them still do it, but in a different way. The question, my question is, why are you not providing it to them? I, I'm, I'm sure it's just this old school. Well, it's fine for everyone else. Everyone else has got to do it, or this is just what you got to do. It's done this way. Not acceptable. Sensory tools, sensory toys, they're important because they help reduce anxiety, regulate emotion. So we're talking everything. You know, fidget toys. Uh, sensory tools, these can be, you know, weighted blankets, weighted toys, you know, whatever we like the the boys, you know, we like the putty, the hard kind of therapy. It's like legit stuff, not the weird, disgusting, slimy stuff that's not, that like makes you feel yuck. These things can help regulate your emotions, reduce your stress. Whether they're the, the things I was saying, the stress, spoily kind of therapy, textured objects, whatever it is, you know, not only providing, not utilizing those, but, you know, kind of finding what works and then providing them, kind of almost, you know, bring it to their attention when you know they need it, can really help them in stressful situations and can really help them regulate themselves again. And what's the bottom line here? They're less likely to experience demand avoidance when they're able to bring themselves back. Another one is open communication. You've just, you've just got to do this, guys. You have to communicate openly with your autistic child and you have to allow them to express their needs openly, their preferences openly. I've never talked to my kid, my autistic kid, from when he was a baby any other way than I talk to him now. Now, what I mean by that is baby talk or not, not talking to them in a way where I'm uh, providing them with the opportunity to tell me what they think, want, feel. You know, the idea that this is how we communicate. It's a, you know, so you just regularly check in. You've got to ask them sometimes. How'd you go? How, how'd you go? How's your day? How are you feeling? Do you need any support? Do you need anything? Like, is there anything I can help you with? People hate this question, by the way. But, you know, like, especially employers. It's clear one of the keys to having content, satisfied and thriving employees is to regularly ask them if there's anything they need from you to do better at their job, right? To make their job smoother, more productive, right? This is, this is clearly the, one of the most powerful things you can do. And it's clearly the, one of the most hated things employers want to do. And they'll say it's, that's not true, but that it's true <laughs> because the first thing they think is all the hard work, <clears throat> voice gone back now, all the hard work. Well, they'll tell me all these things and then I'll have to get them for them. 
So, I mean, I get that it's a good thing to say, put them in our culture, but we're not going to do it in practice because then they'll tell us all these things they want. We'll have to give it to them. That's not going to work. You can't do that. <laughs> it's, this, is, this is the problem. This, this is the same with parenting or knowing an autistic kid. You have to be honest with them, open with them, ask them, you know, do they need anything? Can you help them? How are they feeling? And then provide that, of which they ask. Also, modelling. Modelling behaviours, modelling skills can help autistic kids develop them. So, you know, flexibility of things, problem-solving skills, executive functioning skills, demonstrating how you can adapt to changes and challenges through sharing your own experiences, through physically facing them in front of them, through doing these things, through showing them how you overcame things, how you learned things. Because remember, autism is a neurodevelopmental condition, disability, developmental. So it doesn't mean we can't develop. It just means it's harder. So to develop problem-solving skills, flexibility, Adapting to change, executive function, all these other things, social interaction things, these are things that we can strengthen and learn and develop through your own model behavior, your own experiences, your own vulnerability. A powerful one is incorporating interests and passions into activities. I find this is key for education. It's certainly key to reaching a kid uh, if you want to help them you know, carry out daily instructions, chores, demands. Because what you're doing is, you're working out their passions, their interests, and you're using the things that they don't want to do to merge with the things they love to try and provide them with some sort of motivation to do it, right? So what does your kid love? Is your kid into, you know, Pokemon? Are they into animals? Are they into a certain type of anime? I don't know, right? Utilizing that into activities they potentially don't want to do can actually create the motivation they need. And this is the same in learning. So how can you merge what they love, their passion, into the way you would teach something or the way maybe there's a game to clean their room? It's based on a game they love. That's just a basic example. Adults don't really practice mindfulness and relaxation much. Imagine autistic kids. No, they probably don't. But guess what? It's powerful as all hell, my friends. Can you help your autistic kid, the autistic person in your life, be more present? Bring them back to right now. No, no, let's not think about tomorrow. Let's just come back to today. Let's just work, let's just work through today. Let's, let's relax. Let's, let's practice some relaxing techniques. How can we... How can we make that stress and anxiety go away? How can we kill that anxiety? What are we going to do? Maybe we'll do some deep breathing. Maybe we'll go outside and just lay down on the grass or go for a quick walk. Right? Maybe some kids are into different types of guided exercises, guided meditation. You know, those apps they have for kids. Again, this only sounds completely unreasonable or ridiculous to people who never give it a go. To people who've given this a go, you know, actually, I might not do it all the time, but when I do it, it actually feels really good. Another example of how you can help, honestly, practical way you can help with your challenge of your autistic child and instructions, demands, expectations, is asking for help. Have you spoken to therapists have you spoken to, let's go through the list of all the allied health because they all actually have, you know, the people that work in the area of neurodivergent kids will all face it. So whether it's a speech pathologist or an occupational therapist or a psychologist, even the like physiotherapists and educators, there's so many people that you can lean into to, that you can even do courses or sessions, working collaboratively with other people to develop personalised strategies, personalised ideas based on what the blocks are for your child, how to help your child through those particular things. Really important, really powerful. 
Encourage social connections and friendships in supportive understanding environments is key. So as autistic kids, and I have this from my own experience and my son's, we might not be actively going, hey, I want to play with my friend today or I want to go to my friend's house or, you know, sure, I might have friends, but I don't know, on the weekends I like to stay at home and just do my own thing, right? We're not actively looking for that. But we know that when we do hang out or spend time socially with people that are safe to us, that we do actually get a great benefit out of it. Maybe that means you need to arrange for the younger kids play dates, you know, for older kids, you know, taking them, dropping them off or taking them to a place where they can meet their friends and you can just be in the background and they can just hang out, right? So they, they get to spend time with their friends, safe people. They may have similar interests. They could hang out and do that, right? Again, gaming, cards, anime, movies, TV, sports, whatever. So providing opportunities for social interaction, which really is you just doing the groundwork, uh, it, you know, because they, they do have these people they want to do this with. They just don't think about it because it's not, it just that doesn't often occur to me. Like I might have friends, but do I think about them or, or work out when I should hang out with them? No. Um, it just doesn't occur to me. All right, let's go through a few more practical tips, my friends. And I am going to do an entire podcast on demand avoidance for adults next time. Unless you've already uh, watched and listened to that in the future and you're coming back to listen to this one. And in that case, my mind's blown because I haven't even recorded it yet. But see, you could be listening to this and I have recorded it and it's like a year ago. And you're thinking, what is he talking about? But right now, in my mind, I can't even believe you're saying that because I haven't even recorded that second podcast yet. Maybe I won't. Maybe it won't happen. And then, then this whole thing has become bizarre and surreal. All right, teach se- – oh, that was weird. Teach self-regulation strategies. Autistic people need to be able to regulate themselves because we become dysregulated constantly. So – what, what works for you? What do you think will work for them? Is it those kind of mindful, relaxing things? I don't know. Well, what is it? What techniques work for them? What techniques help them calm down? What can they do independently? Right? So alone time, special interests, passions, these are the types of things that are really key. Fostering that sense of autonomy and independence by in- involving your kid in decision-making, we've talked about this, is super important. You need to provide your child with choices in their own life, right? What clothes do you want to wear? What snacks do you want to eat? You have to empower them to make choices within, obviously, the, you know, the appropriate boundaries. I get that. But what I'm saying is they need to live and die by their choices. Well, that's, that's the snack you asked for, right? So maybe next time you might want to ask for this snack instead. Or, okay, well, you chose that T-shirt. If it's too uncomfortable, that's fine. Go on, go and pick another T-shirt. But you're saying, I will get you a new T-shirt or I will tell you what you eat today or I will, I will pack your lunchbox and not tell you. Surprise! It's like, I haven't eaten anything. It doesn't make any sense. So safe spaces, as you know, really important. We talked about triggering environments. You need to create a safe space for your autistic child to feel like they can decompress, they can regulate themselves, they feel safe. Whatever it takes for that to occur might, might be tiny, but that's what you need to look for. Is my child able to, you know, after a long day or a day, or just any day, able to find peace and relaxation and regulation? Advocating for your child's needs and accommodations is a lifelong thing. I get it. But this is a key practical tip to avoid demand avoidance, especially in educational settings and really social settings. Yes, you need to work. You need to be proactive, not reactive with teachers, with caregivers, with professionals. You you just do. Why? Well, because you know your child has individual needs and clearly those individual needs need to be met. If they're not met, then nothing goes well. So it is, yes, it is a constant daily battle, but it's something you you have to continue to do. You have to advocate for your child's needs and accommodations in school, in, you know, just friend life, personal life, whatever, sport, hobbies, whatever it is, right? You have to do that. I know it sounds overwhelming, 
It's the only way they're ever going to have needs met that are legitimate needs. These are so. The thing is, and this is, I'm not saying this as a way of this is why you should do it, but these are needs that, if not met, can fall under the banner of a breach of discrimination law. That's why it's important. Their needs need to be met because they are they are entitled to education as well. They are entitled to be able to, you know, recreate. They're what? That's a weird word. Play sport. Yeah. Okay, well, they need a few different things. They need their their individual needs met. Yeah, sure. That's so they can partake and be a part of it. But without meeting them, that's a breach of discrimination law because of a a designated, um, a a medically diagnosed disability. This isn't a joke. And, yeah, it's it's a tough life. We're constantly redoing this all the time. Yeah, I know. I'm with you. I get it. I get it. But it's bloody important. Final one, you really need to prioritise self-care not just for your child, but for you and your family. This is a big one. I know it sounds like, oh, that's a bit weird and that's a bit of a turn for the worst there, <laughs> or selfish. No, no, no. See, you have to prioritise your own self-care and the self-care of the rest of your family members. So, yes, it's, oh, wow, all right. You're not going to say it, are you? I am. Raising, supporting, caring for an autistic kid is bloody hard. It's challenging. Frankly, sometimes it can be absolutely soul-destroying. But being the autistic kid is far worse. I've lived it. I know what it's like. So this is not about who's worse. This is about the reality. Can we just stop the crap? Oh, it's just the best thing ever. Yeah, sure, it is rewarding. It is rewarding and it is amazing and it is fulfilling and stuff, but it's bloody hard on a level that parents that have neurotypical kids will never know. That's just the way it is. So you've got to take time to recharge. You've got to take time to engage in things that make you happy, that bring you joy, that make you regulated. You've got to spend time with your loved ones, not just your autistic person, your loved ones. Right? Everyone needs to feel loved and supported. And, and if that means pursuing things that make you happy, then that's what you should do. You know, like if there's uh, hobbies or, or groups or things, classes, things you want to do, do them. Find ways to do them. Find ways to connect with other parts of your family. You know, this is so key. I really want to, I mean, this is what I want to end on. We're, we're, all we're trying to do here is help you help autistic kids navigate demand avoidance. And I, I hope we've done that. But to end on the idea that, but hang on, don't forget, this is hard for you too. And it is okay to do things for yourself because that makes you a better parent or carer. So please do that. Take that advice. And thank you, my friends, so much for listening, watching my podcast, My Friend Autism. I really do appreciate it. You guys are amazing. Until the next episode, thank you for your support. We'll talk soon. You've been listening to My Friend Autism with Orion Kelly. To join the conversation... Get in touch with Orion and binge all the podcasts, blogs and videos. Visit orionkelly.com.au.